Right, at this moment, however, it's time to introduce our second guest speaker. Anthony Dodd is Director of Investigations for Quest International and a Director of Quest Publications Limited, publishers of UFO magazine. He's one of the UK's leading authorities, if not one of the world's leading authorities, on UFO abductions. He's a former North Yorkshire police officer of some 25 years standing, and Tony has never finished or flinched from his conviction that extraterrestrial visitations are affecting the lives of ordinary people on a scale unimaginable. His efforts to investigate and highlight mysterious animal deaths has led him to scores of similar reports, has led to scores of similar reports reaching him from all corners of the globe. Ladies and gentlemen, your warm appreciation please for Mr. Tony Dodd. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's always nice to see all these faces, particularly of friends who come here every year to see uh, what new information we can reveal. There are so many of our investigators and so many other groups which attend these things, it's almost a, uh, a club get-together, if you like. But I would like to just say um, a thank you to all these people who have travelled long distances to come today, and particularly friends from Northern Ireland, uh, all over the country, and of course I do know that we've got uh, people from uh, Denmark, and uh, of course the United States and all our uh, people from Puerto Rico, all good friends, all working on the same thing and that is to get answers to this thing. And of course as our good friend Nick Pope of course is amongst us. We're all trying to find answers, we all know there's something happening. We've known it for many many years and we've been slowly but surely gleaning information which is leading us to um, a conclusion which we are going to without doubt come come to in, in very, very quick time. We are going to know the answer to this. Make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, in very, very quick time. Of that, I'm in no doubt. Things are building up so fast now in all parts of the world. The authorities are not going to be able to keep this thing down much longer. They've done a hell of a good job over the last few years, but it, they just cannot keep this thing down much longer. What I intend to do today, initially, I'm going to play an audio tape to you of an interview I did with a Belgian F-16 pilot who was um, amongst uh, his friends over in Belgium scrambled to intercept UFOs over Belgium. Um, these were the giant triangles which Belgium were getting um, about 91, 92. I've had this, um, he came to my home with an English fighter pilot and um, they allowed me to do an interview with him and record it but it, at that time I wasn't permitted to release it. Um, I have now been given the go-ahead that, that this thing can be released. This pilot has cleared it with his own side, his own country. And so I thought it would be something worthwhile uh, for you to listen to um, on how these F-16s were scrambled, that these things are real UFOs, and that they are intelligently controlled vehicles. Um, if we put the uh, tape on now, please. You will see some footage of uh, taken in Belgium of these triangular objects at this particular time. Like that. Mm -hmm. What they actually spotted, uh, lots of people, was a kind of triangular thing. Mm -hmm. These things really are uh, big spot of lights which uh, showed downwards. That, that was really the shape. Uh, how everybody explained it actually. Yeah, triangular with each yeah. lies on each corner. Yeah. Each point, yes. So really hovering around uh, at, at really, uh, like we said, uh, 30 feet or what, really low. Yeah. And just going away. Uh, then the Belgians they began to take uh, things a bit more seriously. And um, I was at that time, I was based in, uh, in Bosch, eh, which is uh, on S16s, a fighter base. And we have always a QRA with uh, two F-16s ready to uh, scramble within uh, 10 minutes after uh, an emergency call. What happened was uh, they began to take things more seriously and uh, I had already some uh, colleagues who were scrambled. Uh, just people saw it on the ground, reported to the police, the police reported it uh, to our base and then uh, we always scrambled. Every scramble happened, let's say about uh, 9 to 10 o'clock in the evening. So it was always dark. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, some colleagues of mine, well, uh, they got uh, already some uh, intercepts, and then it was about my turn actually. <laughs> yeah. So uh, in the evening, just uh, 
we got scrambled a uh, clear day very uh, nice weather but uh, very foggy on uh, very low levels um, we got scrambled I straight had uh, the feeling well this is for real because uh, it was really too foggy to, uh, to do an exercise sure. so um, but anyway you get scrambled and once airborne if you always uh, fly in pair with uh, a two ship and then you get the instructions and then, uh, well they gave us uh, the vectors for uh, uh, where the target was which was in this case well uh, this thing an identified uh, flying object we went to there um, and we got it uh, eventually very very nice on the, on the radar um, the radar picture well uh, I'm sure you'll get uh, the cassette uh, later on. I'll give the phone number uh, next week via, via doc. Um, it gives the altitude, it gives uh, the speed, the direction, uh, everything you need to know uh, what uh, the UFO is doing actually. Um, at the time we picked it up, it was a uh, uh, low to medium level. Uh, I mean that uh, from 1000 feet to 10,000 feet, was well, about 5000 feet actually. Um, very very slow speed and uh, well almost hovering in fact and uh, just traveling a bit uh, 50 knots or what uh, very at ease what range was? Uh, the range was uh, eventually when we picked it up uh, 30 miles out 40 miles out then we got a, an initial search and at uh, 30 miles out we definitely had, uh, had a, a lock on on, uh, on the thing we closed in and uh, what happened with the other colleagues as well is uh, uh, it stays very calm and uh, it has, you always get the feeling it has everything under control till, uh, till it says well now it's enough and uh, always happened I think with, with me it was uh, about 18 miles out that uh, the thing just decides okay this is enough get an increase of airspeed from uh, 50 to 100 miles an hour uh, straight to uh, well let's say a Mach 8, Mach 9, Mach 10, incredibly and the altitude, well, uh, it went from uh, 5,000 feet straight up to uh, 60, 70,000 foot uh, just in a split seconds at that moment, of course, uh, was well, we got it initially, you see the reaction on the radar and then uh, just brake locks because it can't, can't really follow that uh, yeah. and uh, that was it, we came back uh, I straight had to uh, hand in, of course, the tape, and uh, sure. that's actually what what happened uh, uh -huh. in a few words. Did do you can can you get any indication of size from your radar screen? Of no. The target. You <coughs> can't do that. Yeah. No, uh -huh. because the size. Well, uh, because well, if, if we re well blip is a blip, and, yeah, uh, sure, sure. we can put the angle of the radar really downwards. We can even pick up cars. I see. So uh, I see. it's uh, it's yeah. really. So it could have been very large. It could have been. Yeah, the amazing thing is uh, the call comes from people on the ground to say, well, uh, because actually the thing uh, I was searching for was uh, pretty close to the, the, the town of uh, Liege. And uh, people saw it on the ground, well, they estimate uh, people on the ground who saw it, well, uh, it's really a huge thing. Yeah. Well, like we discussed before, uh, they're all quite huge, quite big. Yeah. And, uh, well, no messing about because... Uh, the initial uh, factors we, we got was uh, from the sightings on the ground and then we picked it up on the radar so we, we were definitely talking about uh, this uh, triangular shaped thing. Right. But, uh, and was it from your point of view, did it appear to be uh, uh, under intelligent control? Uh, well, uh, like I said, uh, it, it, it really knew what was going on because it sits there, it waits till, uh, till we approach till 20 miles out and then it says, okay, uh, this is close enough, guys, uh, we, are, we are gone, so you really have the feeling, uh, I had that feeling that night, well, uh, we are just uh, chasing after something that's really playing with us and that has complete control of everything. And, uh, Slides, please. I don't know whether you all heard it uh, plainly, ladies and gentlemen, that's only a part of the interview, but I think the pertinent points of the interview are that, um, first of all, as far as they were concerned, the ground radar had got the object, the aircraft radar had got the object, <coughs> excuse me, uh, it allows them to get so close to it, then suddenly jumps um, from 13,000 feet to 60 to 70,000 feet in one second. And I think another pertinent point which he mentioned was 
that it does, they appear to be in control. They're playing games with our aircraft, uh, which is very interesting. And this um, obviously was just one incident which we were talking about, but he did talk about many other incidents involving other fighter planes who were playing this cat and mouse game with these um, strange UFOs, and they certainly say that they are the triangular ones which, of course, we've been getting in this country. I'm not going to go uh, too far into the triangular ones because I know that um, my friend uh, Omar Fowler will certainly be talking about uh, this side of it tomorrow. Just, uh, apart, just to say that we have, I've had reports of these things in various parts of the country, whether it's because football fields, they seem to have some um, affinity to motorways. They tend to like to hover over motorways and frighten motorists to death. Um, and I've had quite a few uh, reports of uh, these kind of uh, encounters with these huge triangles. And, of course, there, was, uh, there have been other um, encounters where uh, all the electronics have been cutting out on vehicles and things like this, and they certainly uh, seem to have the ability. Whether they do this intentionally or not, I don't know, because it doesn't happen all the time. It only happens in certain circumstances. Um, right. What I intend to go on to now... I'm going to talk um, a bit about the events which have been going on in Iceland and still are at this moment in time. Uh, obviously, uh, a lot of you people would have heard me talking about Iceland previously at other lectures I've given and the various situations which have been developing out there over a period of time. And my um, early information coming out of Iceland was about the triangular objects, the huge triangular objects which, was appear which were appearing there. And, of course... I had reports, uh, uh, one report particularly, where a triangle uh, came out of the sea just as um, an aircraft uh, which had, was outbound from Heathrow to uh, Keflavik in Iceland. It was coming in on its landing run when suddenly this huge triangle emerged from the sea, shot up in the air and made the pilot uh, take uh, violent uh, evasive uh, manoeuvres. Um, there was another incident, I'm just, these are the ones off the top of my head, where a, a, a plane out of Heathrow again on its way to uh, Iceland was joined by two UFOs on the way across there and one on each wingtip apparently. The pilot was doing all sorts of manoeuvres to try to get rid of these things and eventually nearly put the aircraft down in the sea. Uh, these type of things of course are not made public because uh, they're, not, they're always frightened of passengers uh, refusing to fly in these aircraft when they're uh, encountering incidents of these, this nature. Uh, but these are first-hand um, reports which are coming to me. They're coming direct from the horse's mouth. But, um, oh, I think we're getting there. Yeah, I just want to go on about uh, um, this one here. It's an official document, and it refers to an aircraft which was scrambled. Um, it's in Canada. This is official document, as I say. They're far and few between, and. Um, that's the wrong one, actually. It's, it goes into three doc documents. Where an aircraft was scrambled to a UFO out in Canada. It was on ground radar. The aircraft got it on radar, was vectored into the UFO. Uh, the aircraft um, obviously made its uh, appropriate uh, changes in direction to intercept the UFO. Then ground radar saw the two blips, the aircraft blip and the um, UFO blip, merge into one. Um, Suddenly, the single blip which remained disappeared off the screen. And uh, that was the last they ever saw of the aircraft or the crew. The aircraft or crew were never found. And this is an official report. But I, I think I, it's... Um, it isn't uh, an official uh, aircraft accident report, but the interesting thing about it, it says total cost of the loss on this. And it's $973,000 for the aircraft. And then there's a thing about how much insurance is going to have to be paid out as a result of the loss of the crew. <laughs> In other words, an aircraft intercept with a UFO, merged together, both disappear and they've never been seen since. And it is to my knowledge there have been other um, encounters of this nature. Um, there's a lot of information being coming out of America about um, F-14 Tomcat fighters um, down in the Puerto Rico, Brazil area, um, going in to intercept UFOs and being seen by the public to physically vanish in front of their faces. Now, we don't, we don't know the answers to this, we don't know the top, but we can only go by witness statements and things like this because the military are keeping this, of course, extremely quiet. But we do know, we also know that lo they've lost aircraft over Japan in the same type of intercept missions. People who uh, have been attending these conferences for a while will remember Foxtrot 94, that was the Lightning, which was scrambled over the east coast of England to intercept a UFO. 
that one merged with the UFO, uh, but it did separate with the UFO again after this encounter. But the pilot was not allowed to bring the aircraft back to base. He was told to um, ditch the aircraft in the sea, although the aircraft was totally airworthy. He was told to ditch the aircraft in the sea after the incident. Now, the aircraft did come down in the sea, and it was being observed by some Shackleton aircraft which were in the area. It was seen to come down and uh, land on the water as instructed. Uh, the aircraft quickly sank, and the pilot was never found. Now, when the aircraft was recovered from under the sea, um, the canopy was still closed on it, but there was no pilot inside the aircraft. But that's another story. But it's just... To, it's just pointing out the consistency of those, some of these encounter reports. Uh, that's basically telling you exactly what I've just told you, where the, it, uh, it goes on to the vectoring and the time this thing happened. It was 23rd November 1953, and intensive aerial searches revealed no trace of the aircraft, and its crew are still missing. But that is an official document. It proves it happens. Now, if we go back to Iceland again, the reason I focus on Iceland because there is an enormous amount of UFO activity going on on and around the waters of Iceland. And apart from the one I just told you about, the one that nearly hit an airliner and the, one, the two that chased the airliner across uh, and they travel all the way from uh, 100 miles out of England towards uh, Iceland. And these two UFOs stayed with this aircraft the whole time, even though the, the pilot was taking violent evasive uh, actions they still stuck to his wingtips. They only flew away as he started to get to his landing mode when he was uh, approaching Keflavik. Now, going back to 1953, UFOs were known to be coming down and landing in the ocean up in the Arctic Circle. They were being picked up on the, uh, on the deep space radars and things. And once again, this is a story of its own. This could take an hour and a half on its own. So I'm having to be extremely brief with all this, if you'll, if you'll just bear with me. What I'm going to do is... Briefly tell you about that and bring you right up to date with what's going on up there at this moment in, pro in time. We do know at that time that the American fleet moved up there because uh, what happened was these UFOs, underwater UFOs as they were at that time, were, were, were uh, travelling underwater at very high speed. They were tangling with the fishermen's nets, causing all sorts of damage. Icelandic gunboats were, uh, were called out to protect these ships, but the next thing that happened, the warships moved in. American warships initially, eventually joined by elements of the NATO fleet and two of our nuclear submarines. They all went up there. Now, during the course of all this, my contacts up there were in contact with various um, elements of this uh, fleet. And um, the Russians were also involved, and they were covering the area from the um, Barents Strait, of course, which is the, where they come out of Russia into the main North Atlantic. And... During the course of all these, these operations were going on for quite some time. And during the course of these, suddenly the Americans lost a warship. The warship disappeared. There was an immediate sea search uh, put together with every vessel which had been involved in the initial flotilla, including civilian ships. And they were sent on a search of that quadrant of water for hundreds of miles around that quadrant of water. And that ship was never found. Now... That's, that's just the, uh, the map of the, uh, the area where it, it, all, it was all taking, uh, taking place. Uh, it's in the Denmark Strait, just where this beam goes. There, along there. That's where it was all taking place. Now, at this time, the Americans had one of their new stealth ships up there. Now, if my slides are in order, which I doubt very much. These are just some of the shots of Iceland because it is a, the most beautiful place. It is the most uncontaminated place in the world. And uh, it, we wonder why this activity is up in that particular quadrant of the world. Is it because it is so uh, free from pollution and everything else? Well, that's one, of the, well, that's one of the nuclear submarines that went up there anyway. So I'll get to the um, uh, stealth ships eventually. But there was the American stealth ship up there. Now, the American stealth ship, uh, as much as we know about it at this moment in time, it isn't an aggressive ship, it's not an attack ship or anything like this. It's full of extremely sophisticated electronic gear, which is for scanning. Basically, it can scan in the air and it can scan under the water um, and pick anything up moving either way, either in the air or in the water. And It's so uh, advanced, is this thing, it can guide a whole fleet by virtue of what's happening in this ship. Anyway, the search went on for this um, American destroyer. And um, they never found it. 
I don't know what I don't know what happened to it. They don't know, but I'm telling you, people on the scene were searching the sea for a long, long time, and they didn't find it. And uh, without going into detail, that is what got me into trouble in America when I, I talked about previously being threatened when I went out. I, uh, when I was lecturing out there, I talked about this, and I talked about this American ship which had gone missing, and, and it upset a great many people out there. I shouldn't have been talking about it, apparently. But going on from there, there were all sorts of um, things happening whereby these triangular objects were, mo were seen coming out of the sea. And on one occasion, I got a ship to shore telephone call from my, some of my contacts out there, and they were in a state of absolute panic. There were two of these huge triangles that suddenly emerged out of the sea, and they were hovering very, very close to um, several vessels which were out at sea fishing at that time. And they were hovering over the top of the, uh, uh, top of the ships, or very nearly over the top of them. And um, suddenly, during this conversation, all the, uh, uh, the telephone conversation broke and everything. I lost contact and everything else. And I got reconnected about some 15 minutes later. And apparently, all the electronics on all these boats had gone down. And they suddenly uh, said, what happened is these two giant triangle triangles suddenly um, came down very, very slow out of the sky and went straight down into the sea. And the moment they entered the sea, all electronics on the ships came back again. Now, who is it that's flying these giant triangles? Who is it that's got something which can hover in the air, things as big as football fields, without sound? It can go down into the water like a, a submarine. It can shoot out of the water up into the air. Um, it can vanish. It can do what that pilot was talking about, jump from 13,000 feet to 60 or 70,000 feet in one second. There's no way this is something we've got. For a start, they couldn't, pilots could not stand the G-forces in such vast, uh, fast movement from a standing start. It would kill them outright. There's no question about this at all. Now, from the Iceland point of view, they know. It's not a case of their speculating that aliens are here. They know that they're here. That the residents in Iceland know that aliens are there. They've been seen there. And they've been seen on a, a semi-regular basis. And I'll get to, <clears throat> I'll get to that a bit, a bit later on with this, where... Um, Things have been building up there. During this incident with the flotilla in Iceland, at one time, the, um, all the ships were told by... The, the Americans were in charge. They usually are in these things. They, they seem to be, as far as the um, UFO ET field is concerned, they seem to be the top experts on this, and everybody in the world seems to take notice to them because they've obviously got an enormous amount of experience in dealing with this kind of thing. Um, the American warships told every other ship to stand off and not to come any closer than three miles. And of course, as ordered, everything dropped back until there was a clear circle around the American warships of three miles, three sea miles, three nautical miles. Um, this was getting evening time when this happened. Um, nobody knew why. They weren't told why they were told to stand off. They were just told to stand off. So they did as they were told. And suddenly... The outlying ships suddenly started picking up a number of contacts on their radars. And at one stage, they ended up with 16 of these objects coming in, uh, and they were coming towards the American warships. Now, uh, they got to a situation where the, out, the ships on the outside could actually physically see these objects in the sky. They were balls of, of, of amber light. And the whole 16 actually came in, stopped, and hovered above the American fleet. And they hovered there for some time, and um, several minutes later they all shot off in unison together. Now, there were no aircraft by any standards we got. They certainly weren't helicopters, because helicopters could not have been that far out to sea. Um, and also the weather was too bad from, uh, to have been out to sea anyway. So we had that situation where these extraordinary events were taking place up there. And uh, they seemed to be interacting with the American warships. So... We went on a, uh, we go on a little bit more, and there were continuous events taking place around Ireland, uh, Iceland at that moment in time. And it's still going on to today. Now, a very, very interesting thing is that recently, a lot of Icelanders, they're rather a spiritual type of people, the Iceland um, people, have been receiving some sort of strange telepathic message. And this message... Uh, says really to them that they, they have got to congregate at a certain location in Iceland when the aliens are going to actually come down and they're going to face to face with them. Now this was picked up by hundreds of uh, Icelanders, all separately from each other, 
and they were getting together and they all had this same location. It's something like that Close Encounters film. And an arrangement was made for this lot to get together and to all congregate at a certain location in Iceland, a remote area near a glacier, on the 26th of August. That's when this so-called meeting, or whatever you like, was going to take place. It was all across the front pages of the Icelandic newspapers. And um, lo and behold, two days before this event's going to take place, the NATO fleet turns up. 5,000 NATO troops descended on Iceland last weekend accompanied by a huge flotilla of warships. Out of the blue, unannounced, although the authorities knew they were coming there at the last minute, and they all descended on Iceland. And they're still there to this moment, that is for sure. So the rendezvous, as it was going to take place there, was cancelled. Apparently these people who were going to uh, go to this particular location, somehow or other they were told, don't bother. And so that was cancelled, but as I say, there are still events going up there which are involving large elements of NATO, large elements of, war, uh, of warships, um, and one has got to wonder why. Is it possible that th th there is some sort of aggressive action being taken um, between our forces and a certain alien race? Now, when the previous incidents were taking place, I told you about when the Americans lost the warship, my contacts out there who were out at sea and part of this flotilla at one stage picked up radio messages which were being transmitted from the Russian element of the fleet. And these ra radio messages, what they stated was, we are engaging unknown underwater craft. And we can only assume by when they say engaging, it means the same as when our uh, forces engage, that means they're, uh, they're uh, engaging hostilities. And uh, that most certainly took place as well up there. I'm watching this Iceland area very, very closely because it seems to be the focal point of, of a lot of new developments which are taking place at this moment in time. I've got many contacts out there, and um, this, is, this is just a pictures of the stealth ship which they had out there. An awesome looking thing. Um, but it, it, there, is, there are continuing events occurring out in Iceland at this moment in time, there's no question about that. And it is to do with ET activity, there's no doubt about that. I can tell you that, once again I say from the horse's mouth. The activities which are taking place up there are related to ET activity, UFO activity. But there seems to be this um, extreme fear, and might, maybe quite rightly so. Who knows the intentions of these particular um, aliens? It seems whenever they tend to sort of appear in a particular area in concentrations or, or uh, you know, in large numbers, the next thing we have an enormous military presence there. And uh, I suppose it's all uh, our people get a bit twitchy when something comes down like that. What, what's its intentions? Why is it here? Has it got some um, malevolent intentions in mind? And therefore, they're doing their job. They're, they're doing the best to, to protect the country. That's what, possibly what it's all about. But the point about it is they are here. ETs are here. No, there is no question about this whatsoever. And there's a great deal more proof available of this, but uh, uh, that's another time. So, um, okay. We've talked about Iceland, we've talked about uh, the fighter pilot. And what I want to go on to now is the animal mutilation business, which you, a, a lot of you are aware of. We all know the animal mutilation syndrome is taking place, but I, I wonder whether we all are aware just to what degree this thing is taking place. And trying to make progress with this animal mutilation, because trying to find out what's happening is like banging your head against a wall, believe me. It's a type of thing where people are not supposed to answer que ask questions. Um, can I have the video first? I'll have a, I'm just gonna show you a quick shot of video. Uh, it's Linda Howe's video. And it's, um... Noon, we went out to check the cows. We had some cows that were about to calf. And everything was okay. And, um, so we went back to the house, had lunch. About, oh, all afternoon, we'd worked out on the truck all afternoon. It was a pretty day. And we hadn't seen or heard anything. When about five o'clock, 
I had to go to Kremlin and have to load the hay. So I was in a semi, and the cow was over a little ridge, but I could see off the sweet road. And the cow laying there dead. I got the paint, and I called my wife and told her to go check on it. Half of the udders were gone. You could see into the stomach cavity. The rectum had been partially removed. The eyes were bulging out. I was horrified at the thought of what could do this in broad daylight when we had checked the cows only a few hours before. That cow was the Desiris' third mutilation. In the fall of 1979, they found two of their year-old heifers lying 100 feet apart in a pasture. Both were dead, and their rectums had been cored out. Cause unknown. One deputy sheriff in Wyoming is so frustrated with the mutilation mystery that he has gotten his local crime lab's cooperation to investigate mutilations as they would human murders. Yeah, this fall, we had 10 mutilations, eight in Sweetwater County and two in Baggett County. And in 1975, we had 16. From everywhere I go, they tell me that it's predators, which I do not believe. Why do you feel differently? Because I don't feel a predator can do these things. I don't feel a predator can come up and, and chew a half of a bag off of a cow or the end of the penis off of a bull and not touch any of the rest of the cow. I've been around predators and they go in, they'll go inside the, the abdominal cavity first and eat, eat the insides, which is easy eating. What would be your own personal feelings about who or what would be doing these mutilations and why? I wished I knew. I don't have any idea who is doing it. There's, we've in, we have investigated several things, cults, different things like this, but we haven't come up with any answers to any of our questions as of yet. Trick. Slides, please. That was just to give you some idea of these mutilations. They're not, we, we were initially under the impression that these mutilations were only taking place at night. But that is not the case. They're, they're taking place in broad daylight, yet even though they're in daylight, Nobody ever sees them. Who's done it? Now, I'll just go through for, uh, one or two slides on the mutilations, which some might find unpleasant, but it's the only way you can describe something by showing people visuals. These um, mutilations, like that, um, that uh, lamb, um, happened on the east coast of England, and where they've had a, a real blatting with animal mutilations over the last couple of years. And um, once again, one farmer had 40 feet of sheep in a field killed in one night this way. Um, they actually, um, people have heard me talk about this, but where they actually got a vigilante group of farmers together and they sat in the fields with their guns because of this particular field being subject to, to this blatting. And they sat there all night in this field one night, never saw a thing. Uh, following morning there was a mutilated uh, sheep in the same field as where they'd been sitting guard. Now I've, I've only just recently found out a very interesting thing about this because one of the people who was in that field, and I've only found this out in the last few days, he's been having a lot of problems, um, uh, head pains and uh, blacking out. And he was once involved in a road accident where he had quite severe head injuries. And he went to, obviously, the hospital because of this business. And uh, they said that, they scanned him and said they thought he had a very slight blood clot on his brain. Um, but interestingly, while he's going through all this, it turned out that two of the other people who were in that field the same night as him have also developed the same symptoms and have also ended up at hospital with the same um, th blacking out uh, s situation and um, loss of memory and all sorts of things. And they reckon both of them have probably, uh, have possibly got a very small blood clot on their brains as well. Maybe a pure coincidence, but it is a big coincidence if it is the case. So, there was four, uh, 40 odd in one field. It went on for weeks and weeks, did this over at uh, the east coast of England, up near Scarborough, Filingdales, Whitby, all that area. They were getting a real blatting. And um, it continued for an awful long time. Animals were being killed and they were being quickly removed by the Ministry of Agriculture who moved in, who refused to talk about, deny all knowledge. And um, now that one... Um, is from Northern Ireland, as our friends from Northern Ireland in the audience will know. It's just a typical cattle mutilation where the, uh, there's not a sign of blood around, of course. With any of these mutilations, you never find any blood. There's hideous wounds, there's organs removed, but never a sign of blood. Now, that one, um, 
that cow there has got uh, it, it, half of its jaw has gone. It's just this. It's just the um, the skeleton of its jaw. Uh, various organs have been taken from it, including its its udder. Um, that is for Northern Ireland. I'm just pointing out this goes on all over the place. It's not going on just in the States or Canada or Puerto Rico. Or it's going on here. It's going on in Scandinavia. And um, one has to wonder at times whether this does affect human beings, uh, whether they ever do find uh, human beings in the same situation. And we do know about the one that was found in Brazil, which I'm, I haven't brought the slides today because I'm sure it could distress people to see it. But it is going on. Now, I was talking to my good friend from Puerto Rico, George Martin, before I came on. And, of course, George is going to, he'll, th he'll thrill you with what he's got to tell you about what's going on there. So I don't intend to um, get involved in it. But what, one thing we were saying is that what is happening here with our animal mutilations is identical to what they're getting in Puerto Rico and Brazil. But he will go into that. Foxes. All forms of wildlife. We, one time we thought it was only domestic animals it was happening to. That is not the case. It is happening to all forms of wildlife. And it doesn't matter how big or how small the animals are. And as I go on with this, you'll see by the time I come to the end of this slide exactly what I'm talking about. Hole in the head, brain has disappeared, uh, rectum cord out, um, no blood anywhere in the body. <coughs> There was one incident out on the East Coast where, and um, once again some people may have heard this before, where a chap was driving along the road in broad daylight. As he was driving along, he said he suddenly came, there was, seemed to be sort of a mist in front of him in the, in the distance. And as he was driving along, suddenly a badger fell out of the air and landed in the road in front of his car. Of course, he jumped on his brakes violently. He, did ca he said he did catch the badger with the car, but he didn't hit it hard because, he, you know, it, uh, it dropped a few feet in front of him and he jumped on his brakes. Um, when he got out, the badger was still kicking, but it had a hole in its head, just the same as this, this fox had. And unfortunately, the badger died very, very shortly afterwards. But this thing fell out of the air. Um, now, these, these are, I'm just one or two newspaper cuttings. People have asked me when I've spoken before, do, well, can you show us some of these cuttings that appear in the papers? That was about... Um, um, mutilations which were coming down in, North, down in North Wales. They were getting sheep mutilated down in North Wales and that was just an article that appeared in one of the local newspapers relating to these sheep. Well, this, this was the area where a lot, a lot of mutilations ranging from cattle right the way through the, uh, the animal system from deer to badgers to foxes all the way down were all being found because there's some vast forests around that area. But it's interesting that it's in close proximity to a Ministry of Defence establishment. And uh, whether there's any significance of that by that, I, I really don't know. Now, that is one of the um, deer that was found up in Fandas. Can you see the hole in the centre of the head, which is perfectly round? It's, there's no way it's a gunshot wound, by the way, that, ladies and gentlemen. It's far, far too big for any gunshot wound. Um, there's not the slightest sign of blood. The brain's gone. Um, and I understand, my understanding, that's a fox that was found, that was down the south of England. Um, now, I don't know. It was one that was sent to me where they said this fox had been found in this lady's garden. Um, they considered it was possibly an animal mutilation uh, by, by the sort of pattern that we talk about. Um, I'm not so sure. It's certainly got organs removed. There's certainly no sign of blood there, which of course are indicative of this type of thing. Um, but... Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Now, this is one from America, where they were getting all the deer deaths, the, the same type of thing. I'm just trying to draw the patterns between what's happening in other countries and happening here. And they were, they were getting um, the same type of things where those puncture wounds made in the animals, um, wild deer, etc., in, in fairly large numbers. That's a hole in the head of a sheep, uh, and its brain's gone. Once again, no blood. This one was, um, it's just a drawing. It was a drawing and a statement somebody sent to me. Um, and it was down in uh, Wiltshire, uh, near the White Horse uh, Monument on the hillside. They actually found a mutilated white horse at the foot of that hill. And um, they said it had been mutilated in the, uh, the standard pattern of um, animal mutilation. Uh, but apparently the authorities quickly moved in and uh, remove the horse, carcass of the horse, and, and then nobody could find anything more about it. 
And uh, so that was um, going on at the time when they had the Operation Blackbird monitoring the um, corn formations when they were appearing. You might be just to, just to throw another one in here. Once again, some of you probably know that there's just been a, what would appear to be a relatively big breakthrough in this corn formation business. There is a formation appeared in the last, I think it's within the last week or 10 days, and they call it the snowflake formation, and it is a perfect snowflake pattern, the pattern you get of snowflakes. Now, interestingly, there was a, a student, apparently, down there with his girlfriend, and they were camping out near Alton Barnes, and um, in the middle of the night, they suddenly spotted these balls of light flying around over this particular field, and he, he had his camcorder with him, and he recorded two balls of light coming in over this particular field and then starting to, if you like, dance with each other and moving in a spiral effect over the top of the field. Then at some stage they were joined by two more balls of light, which he has also got on camera, and all four balls of light uh, start to do these aerobatics over this particular field and then eventually they uh, shoot away. All this was um, uh, caught on camcorder. Anyway, the following morning, this exact field where these things have been flying over, they found this snowflake effect pictogram. And I understand that Colin Andrews has got this um, video in his possession. I don't know what his intention is to do, but he has got this. The, the, the people who took the video want nothing to do with it. They're, they're shy of publicity. Uh, they don't want the names revealing or anything. So if it is what they say it is, it's a very, very interesting breakthrough. Um, but they're certainly going to, uh, apparently they're having the film analysed at this moment in time. Well, that was just uh, digressing slightly. Yep. Uh, if people who've heard me talk before will have heard me talk of all the seals which were being found minus their heads up in the Orkney Islands and those areas where these bodies of seals were being washed up onto the beaches and they all had their heads, well we say they were being washed up, but they were being found dead in, on the beaches in quite large numbers. And um, they were all minus their heads and these, this was happening over a period of days. I spoke to the vets involved because they actually um, did some uh, autopsy on one of these bodies and they said that these heads had been removed in a very, very surgical, very precise type of way and that every head had been cut off at exactly the same point and the cut had gone straight through the same um, part of the spine, the two bones of the spine in every case and not once had the cutting instrument touched the spine. So it was really extraordinary. And they were finding these things, as I say, these poor devils, in, in numbers. They said, we spoke to the Seal Protection League, etc., and they said there is no way this is the work of normal predators like killer whales and things like this, of course, who usually um, prey on seals. They said there was no way that this was the case. The big argument was at the time, it was going on by the police and the um, Seal Protection Society, um, was were the animals being killed on the beach or were they being killed at the sea and they were being washed in? Um, the police attitude was that they must be getting killed at sea purely and simply because there's no sign of blood on the beach at all. Uh, but the Seal Protection League were under the opposite opinion. They reckon the things could have been killed on the beaches where they were found. This is an interesting one. There may be some people in the audience who know about this one, but it was some, one that was passed to me from down south where some people um, had their pot-bellied pig killed. It was um, night, it was put in a barn at night, apparently, this pot-bellied pig, where, where they had their other animals, and um, the barn door was closed at night, and it was just a latch, there was no bolt or anything like that, it was just latched. Anyway, when they got up the following morning, they found that the um, barn door had been torn off its hinges, and the pot-bellied pig was missing. And it was found about half a mile away, minus its head and one of its legs. Once again, there was no blood anywhere around to be found. But the interesting thing about it is uh, the fact that whatever had got it out of that, got this pig out of that barn, doesn't seem to have had the intelligence to realise all he had to do was lift a, le a, le uh, a latch to open the door. It had physically got this barn door and ripped it off the hinges. And the people who owned this barn said this would have taken something of extreme strength to have been able to have done this. So that's another strange one. This is just another picture of... Um, a couple of deer that have got the same type of holes in their head and they believe me they have lost a lot a large number of these deers the game wardens up in these areas this forested area up, um, on the east coast of England have been finding these in fairly large numbers and uh, I was lucky to be able to get some of them to uh, get to do some photographing before these things got whipped away before anybody could find them 
even a hedgehog. This is one or two, I've just, I threw one or two slides into the American side of it just to sort of give you comparisons again on what they do. How they actually excise the, um, the flesh away from the lips of the animal, the tongues disappeared, the eyes or ears disappear, yet, once again, never any blood. That's one which, uh, a cow which has had its udder removed, no blood. Um, these are the ones which you've just been recently shown in our magazine. They're from Sweden. It's, they, they are getting animal mutilations out in Sweden the same as we are. And, um, and this is a moose which has been killed and mutilated. And it's got injuries to all four of its legs, uh, which were, bro were broken and the joints were crushed. Now, this, this is interesting, this joints, this crushing business. Um, I've had this come to me before where animals which have been killed have found that the it's been found that the bones, some of their bones have been pulverized inside them by whatever, by what must be a, a very, very powerful force because when you start talking about bulls that weigh a thousand pounds uh, and they're found dead and their, their bones crushed, uh, it makes you wonder what, what is capable of doing this. And it, that, it, or, that brings me back to the, uh, the case of the Captain Mantell case where the um, pilot went up with an aircraft to intercept a UFO and um, was lost. They eventually found the aircraft crashed uh, about 100 miles away and um, the aircraft had come down to ground. The way it had come down on the ground was totally con contrary to the way it should have come down. It didn't come down nose first. It was a nose heavy aircraft. It didn't come down nose heavy. It came down flat like a, 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 um, it, as if it just flopped down into the ground. But the, the, the reason I mention this is because when they got the pilot from the plane it turned out that every bone in his body had been crushed and uh, they just couldn't understand why because this, these injuries were not consistent with an aircraft crash. That's just a chief inspector of the um, Swedish police um, with a Geiger counter testing for radiation. That's a, just a, <clears throat> that's just a close up of the, uh, one of the animals. That's a, that is to show the way the rectum is cored out, absolutely cleanly cored out by some method that we don't even have the ability to do at this moment in time. Now, this is, you can, we're coming to the last ones of these now, but I want to focus on this because these are mice. This is obviously mice. It's a bad picture because they're slightly out of focus. Um, these were found on a farm down in the south of England where they've been having an awful lot of UFO uh, problem, activity, whatever you want to call it. Now, we first had a case of this about, oh, maybe a year, 18 months ago in Barn Oldswick in Lancashire where a family were being um, subject to all sorts of UFO alien activity at their home. I went to interview them at their home. They'd had all sorts of strange things happening, UFOs appearing outside their house at night, strange uh, visitations when they were in bed at night, all sorts of electronic interference at their home. And right in the middle of all this activity, the housewife went out into the garden one morning and found all these dead mice lined up on the lawn. And they'd all got this little hole in their head the same way as the larger animals had, uh, with the rectums cored out. We're talking about mice. Now, this particular case is another one where the same thing, identical thing has happened, where they found all these mice lined up, holes in their heads, rectal areas cored out, and this particular case is related to those who um, have read the story I wrote about the, J the Jason um, Williams case, the young boy who was being abducted, and I'll go into that because I'm going to come on to abductions next. Um, but it's happened on the property which is owned by Jason Williams' parents. Um, so it just goes to show we're going right across the spectrum of animals here, from the largest right the way down to the smallest. Now what in God's name is it that can do something like this to mice? And what are they trying to prove? I mean, when, a, when mice are lined up like this, as they were in the previous case, there's something obviously lining these mice up to do this like that. I mean, that's not sort of a haphazard way of if the bodies were thrown out. They're being actually laid out by that, like that and left like that. So what is the logic behind something which is doing something like this? Is it being done to scared people? Or is it being done to tell them something else? It's very, very difficult to really come to terms with exactly what is going on with this mutilation business because, well, I don't know. 
there is something doing it, and as I say, my, uh, this, um, my, my friend who will be following me speaking will put you in the picture a great deal more with what they have come up with, and they've come up with some very substantial information. I honestly believe that this is being done by some ET. Everything points at it being done by ET. UFOs are being seen flying over the fields where this type of activity is taking place. Regular away, people are reporting UFOs over the fields. Then they find animals mutilated in the fields where these UFOs have been overflying. I have written to more professors of veterinary uh, sciences, uh, agricultural sciences, you name the sciences, and I've written, I've got, I have a book with everyone listed at all the universities and everything else. I've written letters by the dozen about this to them, explaining, uh, sometimes, sometimes putting photographs in envelopes. From, not once in all the letters I have written have I ever had an answer. Never once. That has got to say something in itself. Now, the autopsy which was carried out on a sheep two or three years ago from a Filingdale's incident, which I told our investigators uh, who, are, who attend these conferences, it was done by a professor down at um, Bristol University. He came up with a 40-page document at the end of it, but, um, which basically told... It was being read out to me, the results of this autopsy, on the telephone, because uh, the person who had this autopsy done had just received the report. And he was reading it. He says, you aren't going to believe what this report is saying. And he was reading it out over the telephone to me, and I've actually got this recorded. I, didn't, I haven't got it here with me. I've got it at home on a, uh, an audio recording, because I, I tend to tape some conversations. And... Um, the first thing he said on it was that this animal was radioactive. And the second thing of any significance that came out over the telephone to me was that there is something that happened to this animal which had totally altered its genetic structure. The cells in its body had been altered. They were not the same. Some sort of reversing polarity, if you like. It was at that time when he was reading these things out to me over the telephone that he had a visit at his front door and some authorities arrived at his front door with a warrant to search his premises. And... Uh, confiscated everything he got, including that report he was reading out to me. They took the lot. Um, and they said it was under the national security uh, heading. That is why it was, um, it was not in our interest to know this kind of information. So we went back, or he did, went back to this professor who'd done the original report and says, look, can we have a duplicate of this report? And th by this time, this professor had been got at. He said, look, there is no way I am going to give you another report. He said, I, if anybody asks me, he said, I will deny that I ever gave you the first one. And uh, he said, I wish I'd never got mixed up in this business. He said, I value my family and my job too much to get to any more involvement. He says, so I don't want anything else to do with you. These are what the things that are going on. That's just another one of the mice. That is a bad photograph. They took a photograph, on a t they were on the phone to me and said, look, with these mice, we've got these mice with all these... I said, look, for God's sake, get me some photographs so we can show the detail of what exactly is happening. Um, unfortunately, that one, uh, they put it on a table to get a close-up of it and they, it's out of focus. But what it is basically, I don't know whether you can see it from here, but it has actually, that particular photograph, had it been in focus, will show you the, that the um, rectum has been caught out on the mouse. Uh, but, of course, it is a bad one, unfortunately. Okay. Next thing we're going to go on to is the um, abduction side of things. Um, I just have a, a little slurp. I think the best thing we can do, first of all, I shall go into the abductions thing and some of the cases I've dealt with, but I think it's worthwhile <clears throat> initially just showing you some um, video footage uh, of Darrell Sims in America and some of the implants that they've been removing from people's bodies. Because, uh, as you know, that when we talk about alien abductions, we talk about implants being put in their bodies. And they've actually recovered some of these implants in the United States. So if we can... Um, can we have the video next, please? ...comes back, and it is just amazing. <laughs> Nerve fiber everywhere. No signs of inflammation. These objects have been in there at least 11 years. They 
it should have been walled off. First of all, the objects were not found as the little metal rods that you see here. What they were found is encased in an entombment, a literally a membrane, a, a cocoon. This one first was shaped like a, a like a, a shark's tooth. That's how the about the size you see little shark's teeth on the beaches sometimes when you go to the beach looking for them. And, uh, and it was very dark colored, very dark gray. And um, the the membrane surrounding the objects. Uh, at first, he thought was just there again the uh, the inflammatory response to uh, objects. That was obviously what it was. Had to be. So that's what he thought. He's really he was curious the way it was set up. But so. Um, what we did was take the uh, the first pathology report, as he reported to me, those two, two findings, this finding of no inflammatory cells and that um, there uh, that there was nerve fiber everywhere. And I told the doctor, I said, well, after I'd taken the implants back to Houston, I said, I found a couple of interesting things, too. I said, number one, the objects themselves are magnetic. And I told him about what I'd found on the film, and I checked them. I said, second of all, I said, what we found about these objects is most interesting is that the casing around the outside of them. I said, I fluoresce them as I do abductees when I'm looking for the stuff. I mean, it doesn't take but a minute to check. And I found the same brilliant green fluorescence on the outside of the membrane as we have on some of these abductees. I said, I find that rather curious. He said, oh my God, please send these things back. They send the, the, this, this other evidence. We did. We got a second group of pathology reports back. The pathologist does not know a thing about what's going on here. We never let anyone know. This was, he was completely oblivious to any of this. Second report comes back, hemosiderin and uh, uh, keratin. Keratin is what the substance is around these objects. Keratin is surface skin. What would surface skin being wrapped do, what, what would it be doing wrapped around these objects in bulk and then lodged inside, immersed inside nerve fiber, lodged deep inside the body? Now this lady and this man both have had two different kinds of uh, anesthesia, a long and a short acting anesthesia injected. I'm doing hypnotic anesthesia with her for two reasons. One is to help her so that the, the massive shot she's going to go through that will not affect her. So that was effective. And then I'm doing healing techniques with her all through, all through her surgery. You can hear me in the background on tape doing healing techniques. Yeah, that was to just, I don't know whether you could follow it properly or not, but this is re re relating to the recovery, uh, a recovery of implants on abductees in the United States. Now, there is so much argument going on about this abduction business and whether it is happening or whether it's not happening and whether it's something else or... I was doing an, uh, having an argument on um, radio the other day with Susan Blackmore. Um, her first remarks about abduction some time ago was that this was being caused by a thing called temporal lobe epilepsy. In other words, the brain was being stimulated in a certain way by external electronic forces. If you lived in uh, close proximity to high voltage um, power lines and things like that, this could create a magnetic force which would in fact affect the brain and cause hallucinations. This was shot down in very, very quick time by going to some of the top electronics professors in the business, putting this particular, particular scenario to them, and they turned around and said, she's talking rubbish. They actually committed this to pay, to, to pay for several professors, saying it's absolute rubbish. She was then confronted with this, and then she withdrew this, and she came up with another one. Um, so I had this argument with her on uh, the radio the other morning, where she was talking about sleep paralysis. She was the one who got to speak before I did, and they said, well, what do you reckon to this abduction business? And she said, oh, well, there's no question, this is sleep paralysis. And then she went into detail to say that when people were asleep and suddenly wake up, they find they can't move and things like this. And um, so she went on and on for some time, and I said, then they came to me, and I said, well, sleep paralysis. Well, how come it then? 80% of people who are abducted are abducted out in the street, when they're driving cars, when they're walking the dog when they're out in the garden, or when they're going to work. I said, how do you get sleep paralysis in these situations? Surely to God, wouldn't that be a dangerous situation if you're driving your car and you're suddenly subject to sleep paralysis? Uh, <laughs> so this argument was to and fro between her and me. And um, to, in my opinion, my humble opinion, she was talking absolute rubbish. 
she got shot down with the first um, uh, theory she put forward, and then she comes up with one. Of, she, it shows you she can know nothing about the subject to say abductions are sleep paralysis. How can they when it's happening to you while you're awake? When you're, you're not in bed. What she was doing, she was focusing totally on the reports from people who are saying that they suddenly wake up in the middle of the night, they find they can't move, uh, and various other things surrounding it. But it, with abductions, and we've gone over this so many times, there is no question about it, abduction starts as a child. It starts in the four, five, or six year age group. And we've had this time and time and time again now under hypnosis when we take people. It starts as children. Then that child is repeatedly abducted at regular intervals until they get into maturity and beyond. And all the indications are that that child is being acclimatized in some way. It's having something done to it, or that person is having something done to them, right from childhood up and through, as I say, uh, until they, they, they get into their later years. And, uh, you do get reports of abductions of people when they're getting on into their 60s, but it's very unusual. Usually, when they, uh, they get to maturity and just beyond, they're up to the maybe 50s and that they get abducted. Uh, but it seems to be that particular period leading up to that time. Now, we, uh, I, was, I was asked again today by a lady who was interviewing me, what degree is this going on to? And I'm, I was asked this on the radio the other day. We don't know. We don't know what degree it's going on, to be purely and simply, because there's so many people out there who this could be happening to who don't know it's happening to them. We're only touching the tip of the iceberg. In some cases, people have recollections of the, abdu of the abduction uh, and actually being aboard a craft and certain things being done to them. In other cases, people don't. They'll have a certain strange set of circumstances, as you all well know the scenario like the two girls I dealt with that were going to work, walking to work, and um, half past five in the morning, pitch dark in Birmingham, walking down the road, and suddenly this light came out of the air over the top of them. And um, that was the last they remembered until they, they, they were walking on further down the road, totally confused. Then it turned out there was an hour of missing time. Under hypnosis, it, said it, it turned out that they'd both been abducted at that moment in time, They've been put on a table. In fact, they were actually laying on a table next to each other, both naked, and both having various medical type things done to them, including the usual one, and that is where the probe, a needle-like probe, is put into their navel. And that seems to be a very, very common one with all females. And um, various other things happened in this craft. Uh, apparently, they, they had the handbag of one of these women, and they had it, all the contents out, and they were looking. They had, <clears throat> excuse me, they had a packet of cigarettes in their hand and they were looking at these cigarettes. One of them had this girl's leather coat and it was rubbing it against its face as if feeling the texture. And interestingly, afterwards, when the girls were walking down the road, this coat was wet and um, it was a perfectly dry morning. Both women suffered sunburning, or what appeared to be sunburning, to one half of their body and down their the chest, the exposed part of their, their flesh. Uh, which, once again, is a consistent thing with these things. We've heard about this over the years. And um, that's just Daryl Sims showing some of the slides, uh, the, sli the um, implants in close-up. So that happened to the two girls walking to work. You probably all know about the one where the four people were in the garden having a barbecue last year, um, when this UFO ball of uh, well, it was a ball of light initially, but it shot across the sky above the garden and it turned about turned out to be a big circular disc-shaped object. It emitted a beam from the underside. <coughs> and under, they did, that was the last they knew until they, they saw the thing flying away. We had them all put on a regressive hypnosis, and each one told the same story. And it was told about this beam of light coming from the bottom of this object. They were actually physically dragged inside this beam of light by some um, small creatures which had come out. And once they hit the beam, that was them, went up inside. And then the various uh, types of medical things that, you know, uh, that do happen in these cases, which are once again a carbon copy because it seems to be the same thing that happens all the time. Now, the next interesting one was the little boy Jason, which has caused me uh, quite a lot of kickback from various elements out there. Little Jason, for those who don't know, um, 
is 10 years old and um, he was in a situation where his mother phoned me because she, she was up in the air, she didn't know what to do. They dis she discussed it with her husband and he was just the same as her and they came to me. Young Jason was, would not go and sleep in his own bedroom at night. He told his parents that every time he went up and slept in his own bedroom, he said the aliens would come and take him. Now, he'd no, he'd no knowledge of this subject at all. And, um, of course, they laughed it off children's thing, you know, dreams and all this kind of business and that, but he insisted, absolutely adamant, he would not go to bed in that bedroom. Now, the father was a night worker. He used to go on at 6 o'clock at night, come home at 2 o'clock in the morning. So what they started to do, just to ensure that the boy got some sleep, was the mother would go to bed and she'd take the little boy in bed with her. Normal thing to do. Until the father came on, then he would gently lift the boy out of bed, who would be fast asleep by this time, and take him back and put him in his own bedroom. And this was working relatively successfully. Until uh, one particular night, incidentally, all, during the course of all this kind of thing, they were having all sorts of strange electronic interferences in the house. How, uh, bulbs were blowing at a rate that they couldn't keep up with. Uh, clocks were stopping, it was usually a certain electronic clocks, the digital clocks at about 3, 3.30 in the morning in the bedrooms. Um, all sorts of strange things were happening in this house. And then uh, this particular night, the, the, the three dogs that started barking and uh, making a right racket, and these were three monstrous dogs, they weren't s small dogs. And, and these, by the way, these people, they, they, let, they have a small hole in, a, well, a fairly large one, it's almost a miniature farm. The husband got up to look to see if anybody had uh, come into the house, intruders or anything like this, and there was nothing. The whole house was sealed. They always were extremely careful with this when they went to bed at night. All windows locked, bolted, doors bolted. Um, went to have a look in the situation was okay, and when he went in the bedroom, the boy disappeared, he'd gone. He wasn't in the bedroom. He got the wife out of bed, they searched the house, no sign of him. Um, but they were totally, they, they were bewildered, they thought, well, he's not in the house, where the hell is he? All the house is bolted from the inside, he couldn't have got out without leaving one of the, the, the bolts off or anything like that. They eventually found him, he was curled up in the garden shed at the bottom of the garden, in his pyjamas, fast asleep. This happened on three occasions, and nobody knows to this day how that boy got out of the house and was found in these situations. But he did also start talking about, he, these aliens were teaching him things. Um, they were showing him all sorts of pictures, they seemed to be teaching him some form of binary language, which was a language of numbers. And um, slowly but surely the boy was getting distance from his parents and they were, get, they were getting awfully uh, upset about this because he was really dis uh, um, slowly but surely distancing himself. He was almost speaking above their head. He was talking with a sort of superior type of attitude. They took him to a child psychologist, a doctor, a woman doctor, told him, told him what was going on and said, look, please sort this boy out for us. We're having all sorts of trouble with him. And he was under the wing of this doctor um, for a year, and she tried everything on, in the book on him. Didn't make one bit of difference. In fact, she phoned me one day, and uh, we discussed this case purely and simply because the mother and father had, uh, had asked her to speak to me. And um, she would not, this psychologist doctor, she would not even contemplate the possibility that anything like an alien abduction was taking place. This, these things do not happen. Um, she said, there's something disturbing the boy. I don't know what it is. She said, I've tried for a year to help him. She said, I can't help him. She says, so I'm going to, um, as far as I'm concerned, I'm going to discharge him and say, I can't do any, any good for him. So we had a long discussion, this uh, psychologist and myself, and um, I was telling her about various other things that were happening in the house and this, that and the rest. And uh, she said, well, I, I've got to reserve judgment on something like this. I really cannot accept that something like this is really happening. I said, well, that's entirely up to you, I said, but uh, I'm telling you that uh, the, these kind of things do happen. Anyway, to go on further from on this, all these things continue to, uh, to happen. And it was on this farm where they've recently found these dead mice. Now, Jason has drawn these aliens who he's in constant contact with, and there's no question about it, they're our little grey friends. They're absolute carbon copies, his drawings. But they had all sorts of strange things happening on their farm with their animals. They had all the farm animals dying, suddenly dying for no, no apparent reason. The minister, they called vets to the scene. The next thing that happened was all these people um, turned up wearing this uh, head-to-toe protective clothing, all white with headgear on. All the carcasses of the animals' bodies were removed. 
Um, they were told that they couldn't keep any animals on this particular piece of land for at least 12 months and to apply in 12 months time for a license to put animals back on it. The 12 month period ended. They reapplied to uh, have the animals put back on the land. They went to the Ministry of Agriculture and um, said they wanted a permit to be able to do it again. And uh, when they told them, they, they said, well, what, what are you talking about? We, didn't, we never told you that you couldn't have any animals on this land. And she said, you people came. She said, and you actually give me a piece of paper saying that I could not keep animals on this land anymore. And they said, sorry, you've got the wrong office. This is not us. And to this day, they have denied all knowledge of this. Anyway, because nobody is uh, saying that they gave them this piece of paper saying they couldn't keep animals, they've now started again. And they've put animals back on the property without getting any permit or anything. And it's since they've put these animals back on the property that they've suddenly found these uh, dead mice. But interestingly, I mean, it's right back, by the way, it's right next to Ministry of Defence Properties, this. There's a huge forest at the side of this land, and it, on the other side of this is the Ministry of Defence. Um, they had, it's, it's quite a large area of land, is this, they've got there, and um, apparently once a year, what they do, they allow um, these, what they call it, bikers, you know, the mountain, they use the, um, like motorbikes, but the mountain bikes, off-road bikes, and they have some sort of... Um, get together and they come in from different parts of the world and they have races and they do this on this particular land. It's happened once a year. Anyway, they came this year and uh, they, of course they put their tents down in the field of the, to all these lads. And um, anyway, when they were about to go the night before they went, they, they contacted um, this lady and her husband to thank them for their hospitality and everything else. And they said, well, thank you very much for the light displays that you supplied last night. It was wonderful. So she said, what light display? They said, the light display over the field where we were camping. And she said, well, we didn't, we didn't supply any light display. And it appears that while all this, these lads were in their tents in this field, uh, just about to go to bed, except all these lights appeared in the air over these tents, and apparently they were doing all sorts of aerobatics over the top of these tents. Now, because of the problems she was having with this young boy, she decided to take him away from the farm on a week's holiday and leave the father at home uh, to, to, to look after the house and everything else and the, the land. And she took him away and onto a caravan holiday. It was a long distance away from where they lived. And they took his grandma as well, her mother, with them. And uh, they were enjoying themselves on this holiday. And, of course, once he's away from this place, he seems to be a lot more relaxed. During the course of this holiday, one morning when the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the Jason's mother woke up, she could hear her mother sobbing in the, because the mother had the end bedroom at the end of the caravan, she could hear her sobbing. And she was a bit worried because she's getting on, she's elderly. And so she went and knocked at the door and, says, and walked in and there was her mother laying in the bed and the bed and her mother's were covered in blood. The mother's nose had been bleeding dramatically, violently, and it was all over the pillow and everything else. And... Um, of course, she, you know, she said, I cleaned her up and helped her as best way I can. She said she was very, very distressed. She said, um, she said she was hurting, her head was hurting, and God knows what. And um, so the daughter said, well, what did you do to do that? She said, well, I haven't done anything. She said, in fact, when I woke up about uh, 2, 2.30 this morning, she said, you know when you turned the light on in your side of the caravan? She said, it woke me up. She said, and uh, it, I was all right then. My nose wasn't bleeding then. And so, of course, her daughter then said to her, well, we didn't turn the light on our side of the caravan last night. We've never been out of bed since we went to bed. And the mother said, well, at 2.30 in the morning, a very, very powerful, bright white light came under my bedroom door. And she said, it, it, uh, she said I saw the light, thought, oh, what they got up for in the next room. And then she said, the next thing, and oh, bang, she was out. Anyway, she woke up, as I say, covered in blood. Um, and it's just another one of those extraordinary things which are happening to this family. And from that time on, incidentally, and it's, it's, it's very sad because the, uh, the daughter was telling me this only this week that her mother has sent a message, she lives in another house, of course, she sent a message to her daughter saying that she would rather she didn't come to see her anymore because she's too frightened. And this is all to do with what is surrounding this family. There are many, many more things happening to the family other than I've told you now. Um, strange things appearing in the bedrooms at night. Um, as I say, the dogs going bananas at night. The whole family are in some state of continued shock and they don't know what to do to get out of it. And uh, she phones me up regularly when there's something new happening and says, look, this has happened. The husband got up late the other night. Apparently what they'd done, they'd gone down to the small holding to feed some of the animals earlier on in the evening. And he realised, he I don't know, he got home, they were in bed. He suddenly realised, God, we haven't fed so-and-so, so-and-so. So he got up, got into his car and went to the small holding to just to feed the animals he'd forgotten. 
I think they must have been penned up so they weren't fed with the others. He gets down there and apparently as he gets out of the car there's this huge um, cigar shaped thing hovering just above treetop level over the top of the land. And uh, from his point of view he, uh, he got back in his car and drove the other way. <laughs> so that was and still is the continuing thing which is going on with young Jason. Now then, where are my movie slides? I've forgotten them again. That's the usual. The young, the young boy is Jason there. Uh, his mother phoned me up two days ago, extremely distressed, uh, when the young boy had turned around to his father um, and said to him, uh, there, there must, I don't know whether there been some altercation there or something, but he said to his, the fa his, fa the, his father, said, look, you just do what your father tells you. And he turned around and he says, you are not my father. So, so his father said, what are you talking about? What do you mean? He says, my father is out there. He says, you are not my father. And that has hurt his, fa it real, his real father. It really has hurt him. And he, he just cannot understand why this boy's coming out with these things. Um, but uh, as his mother says, he seems to be developing this attitude where he's looking down at us now. It's very, very strange and uh, she said we don't like it. But it's an ongoing situation with Jason's family and uh, I will keep monitoring the stuff as it comes through and um, I will, that's, that's the land by the way, where just to show you some of the land that they've got bordered by the trees and that. Some of their horses. You all know about that one on the table. This is, yeah, the, this is just some of the other abductees I've dealt with and the types of marks that are appearing on their body after abduction experiences. That is a fairly common one, the circular mark which seems to have almost like bands running through the center of it. That is quite common. <coughs> one of the latest ones I'm dealing with, now, uh, not a pretty sight, um, is the whole family want to remain anonymous. They, they do not want publicity. <clears throat> because they, they, once again they're totally by, bewildered by what's going on. There's a mother, a 23-year-old 23 23 son and an 18-year-old daughter. They're getting the works. They're getting alien figures appearing in the bedrooms at night. Uh, they're getting uh, the young girl, the 18-year-old girl, is see, uh, wakes up, sees uh, strange figures in the bedroom at night because she panics like hell and gets her head under the covers as you would. Um, but she keeps waking up in the following morning finding that her nightclothes have disappeared. Once again, which is consistent, we've had them this before, where people have gone to bed and they've found the night clothes disappeared. Or conversely, they've gone to bed at night and when they've woken up in the morning, they're wearing somebody else's. <laughs> but, and they're not even in their house. Uh, so it makes you wonder what's happening in the middle of the night. Uh, but this particular family, I'm on with this one at this moment in time. This chap, the 23-year-old, is, is remembering quite a bit of what's happening to him and he is... This is what he's, he's telling me. There's no reason to believe this, this boy's lying. His mother's having the experiences, his sister's having the experiences. But he is being taken up into this craft. He's being put on a table, and, and the aliens are actually communicating with him. They're allowing him to see what they're doing. There seems to be some sort of a friendship has developed between him and the aliens for whatever reason. Now, it's interesting because for the first time in all the times... We've had all the little greys reported, all the tall blondes in the background watching what's going on. He tells me, which I find interesting, that these little grey aliens, they're wearing masks. What you see when you see the little grey isn't the true alien. And he said they actually, one of them, actually, he was, this is a conversation ongoing between them. He said one of them actually took one of these masks off and let him see what it was like underneath one day. And he said it was without doubt insect insectoid it had the face like an insect it said, he said it seemed to have no bony structure it seemed to be all soft and uh, like rubbery but <coughs> excuse me they actually performed an operation on him and allowed him to see what they were doing and then on his stomach are the marks of this operation what they did they cut three times down each side of his stomach now this photograph wasn't taken until a week after they didn't realize that I wanted photographs um, and there were three cuts on either side of the stomach going inwards, one below the other. Now, interestingly, he says these little aliens, in these suits they wear, they had three slashes on either side, almost like gills, down the side of the, either side of the spacesuit. And um, 
they, allow, they allowed him to see them doing this. He said, there was no pain or anything like that. And they said, what they told me, that is, this thing will be of great help to me later on. I wouldn't understand it at this time, but it would be of great help to me later on as I got older. Now, obviously, he woke up in the morning in bed, and um, could this have been a dream or anything? And of course, there he has with all these marks on his stomach. Now, his mother, she was so upset about this, she took him to the doctor. She went with him to the doctor. And she phoned me the morning she'd been to the doctor. She said, I showed the doctor these marks, and uh, he said, has he ever had an operation then? She says, no, he's never had an operation. He said, well, they've got, it's got me totally beaten. He said, I've never seen anything like this in my life then. And so those have appeared on his stomach. Doctor doesn't know, but they have appeared. <coughs> That's the end of that one. Um, <coughs> so this family, it's still ongoing. And this, once again, this lady has come to me for help and... The only thing you can do with people like this is talk to them and say, look, well, you really aren't on your own here. Um, there's a lot of people like you. There's a lot of people going through these experiences and therefore you're not suffering alone. She's certainly suffering in silence. She's terrified of outsiders finding out about it because she said they'll think we're going crazy. But it is really, really is happening to the whole family. Uh, and um, this boy has told me a, a great deal about what the inside of these craft are like, the detail of it and all the dials all the computer things around on the walls and uh, a great deal about the aliens themselves. But he says there's no question in his mind whatsoever. These aliens are insectoid. They're like insects. And that, that suit that um, they wear is a protective suit. In fact, they say, he said they actually made a mask for him. Now, it's interesting, this because I don't know. He said what they did, he said, they said, we'll make a mask for you, and then it enables him to travel at certain velocities, well, whatever it is, they, the way they travel. And they actually got one of these things, and they put it over his head, and it had no eyes in it. Uh, it just had open things for eyes, and they laid him down, and he said, and they actually told me to keep still, and they poured something into his eyes. And this thing, it actually formed a solid, like, membrane, which filled the mask. And so when they took the mask off, the mask had like these big eyes that we see that the greys have got. Um, I can only tell you what's being told to me. This family is so genuine, you know, you wouldn't believe it. They don't want publicity in any shape or form. They want help. Uh, even the boy, he's terrified of what's happening to him, but he has got extreme detail of it. Um, I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I've got dozens of these. There's too many to deal with. People coming to me, this has happened to me, that's happened. We're, can we go into hypnosis and all that? There's, I've got a waiting list. And so when we start talking about how many is this happening to, God only knows how many it's happening to. But uh, I don't, it's got to be happening to thousands of people. And particularly, when on many occasions when I have people under hypnosis, they talk about being in the craft, and when they're in the craft, they can see several of the neighbours sat round the, uh, the sort of uh, circular rooms with like benches around, and all the, the neighbours are sat there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they abduct one person at once, or two, or three, or four, as we did in the garden. It strikes me that they can abduct a whole street if they so wish. And um, we know we've certainly had this in the States, where they've actually had, um, uh, on one instance, where they had two coach loads of people totally disappeared. About 90 odd people, all disappeared, never been found since. And when Bob Dean was over here last time, he reckoned he'd just got information that they'd, uh, they'd just uh, found a town where the whole, what was it? It was something like 1,500 people disappeared in a town, totally. And the only reason they found out about it is that some of the people who lived in this town had gone out for a day out. When they come back, nobody there. So, <laughs> and that's supposed to be... So what... We, we, know there's, we know there's been cases like this before. That one happened in Canada where the whole town disappeared and they've never found anybody in that town from that time. So it strikes me that they can do it to large numbers of people as well as small numbers of people. And there's no question about it, they are, they are in control. They can do what they like, and we haven't got the power to stop them doing what they like. Um, it makes you wonder, at uh, the bottom line with it, is whether they're responsible for his being here. They're treating us like the animals on a game reserve, as we treat animals on a game reserve. Um, sorry? Thank you. So, uh, so... Well, we're still on with it, uh, ladies and gentlemen. We are making breakthroughs, we're making progress. It's slow, but we are getting there. Now, just one thing, I've just been told I've only five minutes left. You will have read, some of you, 
<coughs> excuse me, my throat, uh, in the last magazine about this incident which happened in, 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 um, in the Welsh UFO crash, in, is it 74? I've left the documents behind anyway. Um, where a UFO crashed on the hillside, the Berrin Mountain Range in um, Wales. Uh, it came down, there was a huge crash which caused a 3.5 um, explosion, or whatever you want to call it, on a Richter scale. All the residents of the local town uh, heard it, of course, it shook their houses and things fell off the walls and things, and they went out and they saw this glowing object on one of these hillsides, very, very remote hillsides. And one of the locals, a nurse who lived as, as near as you could live to that sort of thing, because it wasn't accessible totally by road, you'd have to, you'd have to go off the road and walk from God knows how long to get to it in, in uh, impossible terrain. She phoned the local police and said, I think an aircraft's crashed, you can see it on the side of the hillside. It's come down, it's glowing on the hillside. And so the police said to her, look, can you make your way up until we can get over there? Being a nurse, you might be able to assist in case there's injuries. Okay, she says, gets in the car with a couple of her kids, off she goes up this mountainous road towards this thing, and um, they get so far, then they have to stop, and they can't get any further. In fairly quick time, the military arrive, and everybody's ushered out of the area. Now, the nurse, when they got to the closest point, they're watching this thing pulsing on the side of this hill. It was a pulsing orangey red light, and she could see small lights moving uh, across the hill, in, near to this thing, as if somebody was walking along with torches and things. And uh, anyway, then they were, they, they were sort of ushered away and the military moved in, put a total quarantine on the area. Uh, nobody was allowed in that area. Even the farmers who uh, farmed that country were not allowed in there for a week. They totally sealed the whole area off. Um, and then, really speaking, nobody knows what exactly happened because the whole thing was so isolated and, and the, nobody was, as I say, allowed anywhere near this damn thing. And um, so basically, and, and this is basically, as I say, I'm short on time, I can't pinch anybody over the next speaker's time. Um, the whole thing seemed to die a natural death. Um, I've recently come across somebody who was part of the military uh, attachment they were sent up there urgently. Not they weren't the first on the scene, but they were. They were special forces. They, they represented a special forces team. And he, this person I know is an. He was an officer. He's retired now. He was an officer on this special forces re, uh, retrieval team. He says they were summoned up to this area at short notice. Um, eventually, when they arrived up at the area, they were um, divided into two sections. His unit was divided into two. He had one unit, and then there was another. He says that he was given, they were told to load some boxes onto their lorries and to take them with all due haste down to Porton Down, which of course is the biological warfare establishment down in the south of England. Um, they did as they were told, exactly as they were told, and of course it was a fair long trip back, so on the way back down to Porton Down, they stopped at a mo motorway cafe and thought we'll have a cup of tea, you know, as the army would. As soon as they got out of the vehicles to walk into this place, somebody came out of a car up to them, flashed a pass up and says, you will get back into your vehicles, you will continue to drive until you get to your, destina your destination. No stopping. They went continuously right the way back to Porton Down, where they went into the complex there and unloaded these boxes. And it wasn't until then that they realised, when the scientists there opened these boxes, that they'd got some aliens in them. Two dead aliens. Um, he said they were human looking, about five foot tall, very, very slim, as if they were uh, somebody who'd been in a concentration camp. He said they certainly weren't uh, human. There's no question that they were not human. And he said it was the day he saw those aliens in them boxes down there, he said it changed the course of his life. Now, it wasn't until later that the rest of the unit who'd been there with them came back to the, their, their billet or the resting place. And, of course, they got together and were talking. And it turns out that the second team, which had been split from them, would, a would actually recovered and given live aliens to take back down to Porton Down. And they were discussing their element, the way they took the live aliens down there. Um, it's, it's very, very new as this case. And this person, once again, has nothing to gain by lying. He, wasn't, he does, obviously does not want any publicity whatsoever. I have confirmed that he certainly was in, in, in the military marines unit, um, a fairly highly placed area. 
I'm going deeper and deeper into this to try to cut, bring out something which will be cast down. We can hold up and say, there's your proof. We are, we, are, we really are that close, ladies and gentlemen. I've got to stop, ladies and gentlemen. I'm getting out of time. Thanks for listening.